My name is Walter Williams. I received my PhD in History and Anthropology from the University of North Carolina and uh, was a professor at the University of Southern California until in 1987 I received a Fulbright Research Scholar Award uh, and chose to go to Indonesia. While I was in Indonesia, I did research on Javanese culture by interviewing elderly Indonesians and as a result was the publication of the book by Rutgers University Press called Javanese Lives, Women and Men in Modern Indonesian Society. Indonesia is a fascinating country. Uh, it is the world's fourth largest country in population, halfway between Australia to the south and uh, Southeast Asia to the north. Indonesia is a land of uh, many thousands of islands, over 13,000 islands. Indonesia is a country of uh, beautiful tropical islands. It is a, uh, has stunning beaches and many um, beautiful tropical fish. Fishing is a mainstay of the economy. When I was uh, doing the research for my book, Javanese Lives, I focused on the people of the island of Java. Java is the largest island of Indonesia, and it is uh, the more populated than the state of California. For example, the state of California is about the same size as Java. California has 38 million people. Java has over 138 million people. So it is one of the most concentrated uh, and highly populated areas of the world. Java is so highly populated because it is um, an area of volcanoes. There are active volcanoes going on all the time, sometimes um, heavy eruptions, sometimes just gentle flows of lava, but this continuous introduction of lava into the soil of the island of Java has made it a very highly concentrated soil that is very rich in nutrients and, and extremely fertile for farming. And so, as a consequence, Java has been for uh, several thousand years an area of major agricultural production, especially rice production. Rice farming is done in some very complex terracing that was set up over a thousand years ago that provides irrigation to the different levels of the rice fields and so along with the areas of farming there are uh, small villages in, uh, close to each farming area and the people live there but there are a lot of people in these villages and there are a lot of villages all across the, the island of Java. The harvesting, planting and harvesting of rice is a major occupation of the farmers and then they have to take the harvest of their crops uh, to the towns uh, for the markets and this is done traditionally by using uh, cows and oxen and water buffalo as uh, to drive their wagons. The people of Java are agriculturalists in outlook and many of their daily activities. They are also known as um, beautiful designers of cloth and this goes back into the his history of Java where the technique of batik tie, uh, dyeing of cloth was developed. Uh, Javanese um, cloth dyers and batik artists have developed many beautiful patterns of different colors, especially uh, the royal family had, uh, and the Sultan's Palace of Jakarta had their own uh, traditional style of cloth. So today Batik artists are highly known and uh, highly valued for their traditional skills in making this form of art that is used for clothing as well as for art uh, paintings that hang on the wall. When I 
did my work for the research in Javanese in the book Javanese Lives. Uh, I divided it into three sections: uh, a section on the past, a section on the present, and a section on the future. And all of these were based on the attitudes of the people that I interviewed, um, mostly elderly people, ages from uh, from their 50s into their 80s, and what their views of their history were. But we get a lot of attention to the ancient history of Java coming across in their ideas, especially uh, the first influence which was animus in religion and so th there are still today many animus ceremonies and performances of traditional performers including uh, transvestite inform uh, performers in ancient styles of music continue right up to the present. In the animist tradition, healing is the most important thing. And so traditional healers are the people that are most important in this continuing animist tradition. There's also uh, the importance of dance and many dance ceremonies um, and with elaborate costumes and masks and outfits that continue to be popular in the folk culture of Java right up to the present. There are many different ceremonies uh, marking different parts of the year, marking the harvest, and all different kinds, types of events that occur in the lives of people from birth to death. The traditional styles of uh, dress are also reflect in the um, ancient uh, traditions of Java. In these animist religions, everything was considered sacred, including even daggers that were worn at the back of a man's outfit as he was wearing his sarong. Markings of on the face or on the body were important, and all these different ceremonies are uh, continue to be important. Wood carvings and masks were very important in these animist religions. But the, the next important cultural influence on Java was from India. And this was the expansion of Indian culture, especially the Hindu religion. And even today, one of the most stupendous Hindu religious sites in the world is at Prambanan, which is very close to Jogjakarta, where I lived. And Prambanan, the ruins of this ancient Hindu temple complex, are seen by tourists that come from all over the world to see Prambanan. But there are many different um, ruins of Hindu temples throughout Java, and the, these uh, continue to be evident throughout uh, the island. Uh, carvings in stone mark the uh, different uh, Hindu deities. The Hindus worshipped many different types of gods and goddesses, including an elephant god, including uh, different other kinds of deities. And so the Hinduism is reflected not only in the ancient uh, ruins, but also in many of the uh, clothing styles that we see, especially in traditional Javanese ceremonies. Um, for example, in weddings, um, the uh, ancient South Asian clothing styles are used in weddings quite a bit. Hindu style is also uh, prominent in many of the uh, dramas and dance performances, especially of the Ramayana, which is one of the main stories in, of ancient India that has been taken into Javanese culture. In the performance of what are called the shadow puppets, and the shadow puppets are made of leather, and they're very intricately designed with arm, movable arms and legs so that the puppet master can move them around and they are shown a, as, as a shadow on a white sheet that is, separates the audience from the puppet master. But interestingly, about half of the audience sits behind uh, the lights so that they are watching the puppet master at work. Um, the uh, shadow puppet plays are a very important part of this tradition of Hindu religion. Another important part is Javanese music. And as Java is famous for gamelan music that is a very gentle sound that is a, a mainstay of Javanese culture.
The next great cultural influence into Java was Buddhism, which also uh, came from South Asia, especially from Sri Lanka. Close to Yogyakarta is the Buddhist site of Borobudur, which is one of the largest and most stupendous Buddhist shrines in the world. And uh, as you enter Borobudur from the from the steps at the bottom, you go through the the each level represents the ten worlds of Buddhism. And as you travel from the lower worlds of uh, misery, greed, anger, stupidity, up to the middle worlds of tranquility, and to the higher worlds of learning, compassion, creativity, you get to the top of the temple which is, represents the state of enlightenment or uh, Buddhahood. And this stage has statues of the Buddha in, in some cases, uh, a Buddhist bell shape. A bell has much symbolism in Buddhism. And so within this area, the, the focus of Buddhism is on meditation and on uh, trying to gain personal enlightenment. The Buddha rejected the idea of, of a god or a deity and instead said that what one should strive for is internal enlightenment and his teachings offer a way to develop this. This is still seen in traditional Javanese culture uh, to the present. The next great influence uh, from outside Indonesia came from the Middle East and that was the influence of Islam. And uh, Islam uh, first came into Indonesia about uh, uh, seven or eight hundred years ago and started with traders that came by sea and then uh, started converting uh, rulers and, and the upper class into their Islamic religion and then it gradually spread to the masses of the people. Um, what we find is that today the majority of Indonesians are Muslim and Indonesia is the largest Muslim nation in the world. But what we still find is that there are continuous uh, elements of Hinduism and Buddhism and animism in uh, much of Javanese culture. The next influence of from outside Indonesia was uh, from Europe and this was with the coming first of the Portuguese and later the Dutch and the Dutch established uh, col their colonial empire and called the this area of the world the Dutch East Indies and they became the colonial masters while the Javanese people were doing the work to provide for the uh, economy. In my book Javanese Lives I concentrated on the memories of elderly Indonesians and so these were the people that grew up during the Dutch colonial era. While the memories of these people depended on their class background, the Dutch uh, kept their power partly by depending up on the royal courts to serve as sort of intermediary, intermediaries with the people. And so they, they gave certain privileges to the, the royal class, but the majority of Indonesians were very impoverished. And they lived a very poor life because the Dutch took all the wealth out of Indonesia. It was a very exploitative system and the, Indonesian, the mass of the Indonesian people were, were left in poverty. This continued uh, for uh, about uh, two to three hundred years uh, and but resistance started e even among some of the royal class uh, Prince de Ponogororo who is depicted uh, in this painting is an example of colonial resistance uh, to the Dutch. The next major change in Indonesian history was a result of the expansion of Japan. Japan began its island empire um, by expanding uh, first into Korea and then Manchuria and then in 1937 you know, expanding into China and then in uh, right after the bombing of Pearl Harbor in Hawaii uh, starting the war between the United States and Japan. Japan very quickly expanded uh, southward into the Philippines, into Southeast Asia, and down into Indonesia. And at the same time out into many of the islands uh, of the Pacific Ocean. 
So the Japanese idea was to very quickly establish their control of many of these areas of, uh, of East Asia, Southeast Asia, and the Pacific uh, before the Americans could mobilize and then hope that they would be able to establish their empire during that time. They relied very heavily on aircraft, on air warfare, and even today in Indonesia there are remnants of these uh, bombers, these Japanese bombers that uh, sometimes crashed um, or did not have their bombs exploded. Um, but the destruction that was rained on Indonesia by the Japanese um, through the Dutch uh, colonial masters into confusion. Uh, Holland at that time had been invaded by Germany and so the Dutch were not even secure in their own homeland but the colonial system just fell apart and so the Japanese were able to successfully defeat the Dutch and they threw the Dutch out and so the Dutch managed, some of them managed to escape to uh, Australia. Uh, some of them were put in internment camps where they were held by the Japanese during the war, but the, the Dutch were overthrown. Now at first this made Indonesians very happy. They were thrilled that the Japanese had liberated them from their Dutch colonial masters. But then uh, they found, according to the information of these elderly people that I interviewed, that the Japanese army was just as oppressive and sometimes even more oppressive uh, than the Dutch colonial army had been. And rather than uh, seeing the Japanese as their liberators, uh, many Indonesians then started seeing the Japanese as just as oppressive and just as awful to their country as the Dutch had been. At the end of World War II, when the Japanese surrendered, uh, Indonesians were very happy because they thought that this would mean that they would now have their independence at last. But then the Dutch came back in and tried to reestablish their colonial empire right after World War II. Um, this was not successful though, and with massive resistance by many Indonesians, uh, a revolution uh, began in 1946 and 1947 against the Dutch and it, the leader that emerged was named Sukarno and he became the first president of Indonesia. Uh, the revolution was supported not only by, by men but also by many women and so the, the Indonesian revolution uh, is one of the first modern revolutions where women had a significant role in it. The, independent nation of Indonesia was established in 1947 and its unity was translated in English as is unity in diversity and uh, that's exactly a, a good metaphor for Indonesia. It's a very diverse a place with many cultures uh, but the government tried to make a unification of this very diverse thousands of islands into one nation. One of the things that Sukarno um, did was to try to simplify the language and so he got together a group of linguists to use a Roman alphabet to come up with a simplified form of language. It was based on Japanese but it was not as intricate and complex as Japanese and it's written in the Roman alphabet. And so this was one of his lasting influences. Um, Sukarno is remembered by Indonesians in, in many positive ways but also in negative ways. Um, he was uh, a very astute political leader but he was terrible at running the economy. And so the economy of Indonesia went through many years of turmoil under Sukarno. Uh, people were actually on the verge of starvation um, because the economic system was in many areas uh, near total collapse. So even though Sukarno has been honored and at his uh, grave there's this big monument to him as the, as the founding father of Indonesia, but at the same time uh, he's remembered uh, for other parts of his policies that were not so popular. One of the things that happened was that um, uh, there was a great political division and um, Sukarno sided with uh, the leftists and, and, or, and, and many communists who lived in Indonesia 
Uh, and, and so there, by 1964 and 1965, there was an era of virtual civil war between the communists on the left and the military on the right. And the military won. And under the leadership of uh, General Suharto, um, they uh, literally slaughtered thousands of, of communists or suspected communists. And so Suharto began his reign in a very violent way. but. Uh, once he established um, power and had, had um, kind of shunted Sukarno to the side, General Suharto tried to establish what he called the New Order. And he wanted to, to focus on building Indonesia economically. He also sided very closely with the United States uh, in, uh, against Russia and the Cold War, and so communism was, was thrown out and Indonesia became a firm ally of, of the United States. In this time, there was uh, more um, uh, order in people's lives, and so many people that I interviewed uh, appreciated this order and uh, um, uh, allowed for them to resume their daily lives. At least they weren't starving to death like many of them felt uh, in the years before, and they weren't subject to all the violence of the Civil War that had gone on in 1964 and 65. Suharto also uh, allowed for more uh, freedom of religion, and so um, uh, the Christian minorities uh, were able to um, establish their uh, churches and their congregations more openly than ever before. And so Suharto was both a, a military dictator but also a respecter of the diversity of Indonesia's people. And as long as, as a person did not criticize the government, they were relatively free to take part in whatever kinds of religious, social, or political activities they wanted to. Uh, but it was very important not to criticize the government. Suharto also began a, a program of massive economic industrialization of the economy. And he, more than anyone else, is responsible for the modernization of the um, Indonesian economy. And so the people that I interviewed had lived their lives going from the colonial era of the Dutch uh, through the Japanese invasion, through the Indonesian Revolution, up to the era of industrialization and into modern life. And so by the time I interviewed them, these people had, had experienced more change in their lifetime than probably any other group of people in the history of the world. Um, the, uh, and a parallel example would be one person living through the British colonial era uh, living through the American Revolution, living through the Civil War, living through the era of industrialization and right up to the computer age in one lifetime. That's how drastic the change has been in these uh, people's lives. And, and so many of them have very different feelings about uh, the status of life in Indonesia. They want to hold on to their traditions and their spiritual values whatever, how diverse they are with this, this uh, massive uh, influence from different areas of the world, uh, from South Asia with Hinduism and Buddhism, uh, from the Middle East with Islam, and from um, the West and, and from Europe with Christianity. And, and so with this diverse religious and, and social diversity, Indonesians have a very um, kind of ambivalent attitude toward the future. They, in many cases, they look forward to the future, but they're also worried about losing their traditions. As urbanization and industrialization continued, the cities became larger, the population grew bigger and bigger, and it became more and more difficult to manage um, the economy. Uh, the money, the rupiah of Indonesia became severely inflated. And finally, in 1997, um, there was a crisis of the banks uh, beginning in Thailand and then spreading throughout Southeast Asia. And when this economic uh, depression hit, it, it really hit the Suharto government very hard. And so massive protests began against Suharto 
and um, he became much more unpopular than he had been before, and people started rising with protest more than they had ever done before. Uh, Suharto was, was forced out of office in, in 1998, and then soon after that uh, he died, and so Indonesians also have a very ambivalent memory of him. He was responsible for much of the economic progress of Indonesia, but on the other hand his government um, in some ways became very corrupt. Uh, not him personally, but many of his cohorts and even family members. And so a lot of people did not like that part of the Soharto regime. So since that time, Indonesians have tried to move toward uh, a new way of life that balances their appreciation for their traditions, but also their understanding of the modern life. And so, as I ended my time in Indonesia, I think the image that I find most um, striking to me is the image of the children, and seeing the children uh, with their hopeful attitudes about the future uh, makes me confident that Indonesia will continue to work out its problems, and that it will be able to uh, move into the, the globalized modern world in, in a, a very productive way. So I end my book, Javanese Lives, with from the perspective of the people who, who, who live those lives, trying to give a perspective of what they look at and what they think is important in their lives, going back from their earliest memories growing up in the Dutch colonial era through the Japanese invasion, through the Indonesian Revolution, and on into the modern era. And so this book is designed to give an appreciation for that wide variety that exists in Indonesian culture. I asked uh, Professor James Peacock, who is one of the leading scholars of Indonesia, to write the introduction to the book. And he ended his introduction by saying, Walter Williams has done fine scholarship in allowing these Javanese people to tell us something about their lives and experiences. When we open this volume, most of us know nothing about Javanese lives, culture, and history. When we close, we have we leave with a firm step towards such knowledge, and we acquire it through acquaintance with engaging and admirable individuals, poignant memories we are privileged to share. And so that's what I tried to accomplish in the book, is to make the memories of these individuals that I interviewed stand out as examples of the diversity of lives in modern Indonesia so that we can gain an appreciation from both uh, women's perspectives and men's perspectives, from the perspectives of people of different classes. And I put all of these together in this book that uh, has been published by Rutgers University Press.